Hello and welcome to The Drum. I'm Ellen Fanning. Coming up, the government wants us all to take a holiday, offering half-priced flights to select destinations, but is it enough to save the ailing tourism industry? The CEO of the law firm representing Christian Porter reportedly steps down after questioning the morality of accepting his case. And that interview continues to make waves as Australia's Republican movement steps up to say the time is now. Joining me on the panel tonight, CEO of the Tourism and Transport Forum, Margie Osmond. Good evening to you. Thing. It may be a good evening or not. I'll ask you in a moment. Yeah. <laughs> in Brisbane, Managing Director at Iscariot Media and Associate Professor Practice at QUT Business School, Lisa Watigo. Lovely to see you again, Lisa. Lovely to see you. In Canberra tonight, Business and Economy Editor at The Conversation, Peter Martin. G'day, Pete. G'day. And in Griffith, Professor of Practice at UNSW School of Education and former New South Wales Nationals leader, Adrian Piccoli. Piccoli, good evening to you. G'day, Ellen. And you can join us on Twitter using the hashtag The Drum, and we're on Facebook. First up tonight, a question that goes to the heart of how our legal system functions. You may not have heard of Minter Ellison, but they are one of the nation's most prominent legal firms, and they've been advising Attorney General Christian Porter on his response to an historic rape allegation. So far, nothing too unusual. But last week, the company's chief executive, Annette Kimmett, sent an email to more than 2,000 staff questioning whether it was right for the firm to be representing Mr Porter at all. <coughs> the nature of this matter is clearly causing hurt to some of you and it has certainly triggered hurt for me. I know that for many it may be a tough day and I want to apologise for the pain you may be experiencing. The acceptance of this matter did not go through the firm's due consultation or approval process. The, C the email divided the firm and the partner who's been working with Mr Porter responded the very same day. I would have thought that a majority of our partners would believe that everyone is entitled to a presumption of innocence and legal representation. It's being reported that Annette Kimmett has been asked to stand down and she's been told her services are no longer necessary. Um, I'll go to you, uh, Adrian Pickley. You're a trained solicitor, perhaps a recovering solicitor. I always <laughs> thought um, lawyers were like taxis. You hailed one and they had, if they were vacant, they had to take you. Well, everybody's entitled to legal representation. Now, and a firm doesn't have to, or a lawyer doesn't have to take, doesn't, he's not forced to take anybody as a particular client. Uh, but obviously, in this case, one of the partners has decided to take the client. I presume what the issue here is, though, is the CEO obviously had an issue with it around the ethics of the firm and whether whether they thought this, whether, as a CEO, she thought the organisation wanted to take on this case. And probably the issue is that the email went out to 2,000 staff rather than internally within the partners to say, hang on a second, next time this comes up, this needs to be handled differently. So maybe kind of airing a grievance with one of your partners across all the staff in that organisation is probably what got the CEO into, into trouble. I mean, but the other thing that just bothers me here is, gee, we just react so immediately to um, to, to any situation now. If, if something's trending on Twitter, then somebody's got to resign and, um, I don't know, it just seems to be somewhat of an overreaction and it, this is not a unique case. Um, the CEO expressed an opinion uh, about something and now she's got to resign. I, I just think mm. we've just gone into such immediate reaction. Everything's about outrage and, and, and somebody's got to go. I just think, uh, I think everyone just needs to calm down and oh. allow people to express an opinion. Well, Lisa, a year at the QUT Business School, one of the buzzwords mm. about business these days is purpose. I mean, yes. isn't it the purpose yep. of a law firm um, to represent people. I mean, if, you, if you're a criminal law, you, lawyer, you represent people accused of monstrous things. If you are a divorce lawyer, you defend people behaving appallingly sometimes. If you're a corporate <laughs> lawyer, you defend vacuums who might exist, uh, for clients yeah. who exist in a moral vacuum. I mean, that's the purpose of the business, isn't it? But I think the issue is probably more that, and I'm not a lawyer, so I will, I'll just say that I'm, I don't have a legal background, but I certainly have a business background and I think that um, we can't 
I guess, move away from the fact that businesses have a purpose and it is a business. It's a business. And um, in 2021, businesses want to be seen to be doing the right thing. And ethical business is a big part of doing business these days. We don't live in a vacuum. We don't operate in a vacuum. Um, I've spent the day here in um, Brisbane talking about ethical um, suppliers and what does that mean and what are the criteria for e ethical supply with it for the Queensland government. And I think that, you know, as business owners, we have no choice but to really think about the what it is that we do, the jobs that we take in. And I think it's a bit naive just to simply say, well, this is what we do and we can take any client. That said, and I'm going to contradict myself, <laughs> that said, sometimes as a small business owner, you do take jobs that you think, oh, I don't know if I, you know, if this really sits with me, but sometimes you need the, you actually need to take the job in order to, to um, feed your family and to keep your employees. I'm not sure that that was the case here, but you know, I'm, I'm not a, a completely across it, but I don't think you can separate purpose from business anymore. Peter Martin. I'm um, going to be like Lisa. I'm going to contradict myself <laughs> <laughs> already, right? So I, I look uh, on, on one hand, um, yeah, lawyers have got to represent murderers and, and so on. I mean, mm. that's, what, that's what they do. Um, on the other, th there's this uh, view, and it's 50 years old now. It's called the Friedman Doctrine. Milton Friedman was so... Um, shall we say, unself-effacing, that he named it the Friedman Doctrine. <laughs> he, he published it in uh, uh, the, the New York Times. And uh, the subtitle for his uh, fa famous article, The Friedman Doctrine, was the sole purpose of a firm is to increase its profits. Now, that mm -hmm. became the orthodoxy. Yeah. It's taught in universities and so on. Uh, it's no longer the orthodoxy, uh, really? the New York Times. <laughs> the New York Times, the uh, Chicago uh, Business School, he was at the University of Chicago, had a conference last year re-examining the Friedman Doctrine and it would be fair to say that almost everyone agreed that it is dead. That is to say... Did they agree Did have... they agree that after drinks quietly in the bar <laughs> afterwards? When, no, they didn't have a microphone. No, nah, it's in on, the papers. Uh, <laughs> the way, actually, it was a virtual conference, oh, but, right. uh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, that, the, 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 yes, uh, people now accept that firms have to do things other than make money and... Uh, you know, that, that's actually one of the things that defines human beings is that uh, we care about things other than, uh, you know, maximising our next meal or something like okay, that. Contradict Having yourself. said that, yeah. I've contradicted <laughs> myself with my earlier remark about uh, how uh, lawyers are meant to represent clients. I feel sorry uh, for the um, mm. executive. She was uh, concerned about her staff. She was expressing genuinely felt views about what the uh, the firm should be doing. Yeah. Um, Maggie, is there a way to acknowledge the events of the past few weeks and, the t and to say to um, 2,000 staff members, look, this has been traumatic for a lot of people, male and female, and um, perhaps because of what they've survived themselves. And might there be a way, have a way, a, a way to have acknowledged that without undermining like Magna Carta, you know, the whole basis that everybody has a right to justice and a right to a free trial, a fair Look, trial. I think it was probably well-intentioned but ill-conceived. Um, I think Adrian's probably put his finger on it. It was an attempt to address a particular issue and problem and perhaps it should have been a subject of consultation between the partners before it became an issue with every staff member, which virtually guaranteed that somebody would leak this activity and it would become a cause mm -hmm. celeb. And I think the, the other part of this too is, uh, interestingly, I think... Um, for two of the opinions here, yes, a firm is designed to make profits, but in this day and age, can they make the profits they should if they are not responsible? Because people will make decisions about where they put their money and who they employ on whether or not those firms are doing what's perceived to be the right thing. So, Well, there was an argument that said that a firm like this would get a lot of government business and that might have been a consideration beyond the principle of the thing. Oh, look, I, I would hazard a guess that really it was something much more old-fashioned than that. It was just that everybody's entitled to legal representation. I think without making any comment on the issue in question
question there. I do think that one of the things that's a bit of a worry when you have this kind of outcome and it becomes so public is what kind of damage does it do to the client's case mm. as part of this process? And I don't think anybody's talking about that at mm. the moment. So I think there's probably an object lesson for legal firms here and anybody who hasn't got their risk committee looking right now mm. at what happens when we accept this kind of case and what are the dead set absolutely no deviation procedures, mm. I'd be surprised. Mm. And what's interesting is I think Kimmet was brought in because all law firms are looking to, be, <laughs> to morph, aren't they, Adrian, into sort of mm. accountancy firms and consultancy firms and consultancy firms are hiring lawyers and turning themselves into law firms. So I don't, I think to be fair, she's not a lawyer. Uh, and uh, that, that, that might have been part of the, the, the cultural disconnect with the partners. Yeah. You, don't, you don't need to be a lawyer to be a good manager of a law firm. I mean, the, the CEO of you know, BHP probably didn't drive dump trucks um, earlier in their career. Um, but I, I, and, I, and Christian Porter is entitled to a presumption of innocence mm. and entitled to be represented. Um, and I think that's the bottom line here. I mean, he's kind of talked about as if he was some... Um, as if he's, you know, hmm. virtually a convicted person, yes. and, and he's not. And I, mean, I, I can imagine how the partner who took his took took his case and represented him uh, would feel pretty aggrieved by that as a lawyer. And it's hmm. the whole principle that he's that, that partner's lived his whole professional life. Uh, everybody is, including the guy who did what he did in Tasmania um, 20 or 30 years ago, um, Ivan Balazina. Everybody is entitled to that. Yeah. It's and, not. It's uh, not really though. It's. It's not really that. Uh, it, it's defamation, right? And people are entitled to have their reputations protected using the defamation law. That. That's what the specialist has been brought in for, not to defend. Christian Porter yes. against charges which will probably never be laid. Mm, mm. Which results in the same argument, I suppose, which is one of, of reputation and the potential reputational mm, damage mm. with this spat. Well, the effects but I wonder if there's... Yes, Lisa? Oh, sorry. Go I was on. just going to say, I wonder if there's a bit of a Streisand effect here, you know, by letting <laughs> the CEO go, we actually are now talking about something that could have just been dealt with internally with a little bit of outside help, but we're now, this is now an issue, so, yeah. You better explain the Streisand go, effect for the... Oh, so majority of the population you... who haven't heard of it. <laughs> oh, it's it. where you, by trying to hide something or or bring it, attention to it, you actually, by hide, to, in order to hide something, you actually end up yeah. making it more exposed. I think and who like, was it? Who yeah. was it? Who did it? Barbara, Barbara Streisand. Streisand. Yes. <laughs> she took a defamation yes. case, I think, and by the no, time no, she finished with it, was it? photographs of her beach taken from the public yeah. beach of her backyard. And uh, after that, a lot of people started publishing them. OK, so we've got the Friedman effect and the Streisand effect. Oh, and, look, we're, and we're only like 12 minutes into the program. International <laughs> celebrities and a bit of real estate. Excellent. Perfect. We're covering everything, Ben. We're going well. Yeah. The effects of Prince Harry and Meghan's tell-all interview with Oprah continue to ripple out. The Australian Republican movement is hoping Meghan Markle's allegations of racism within the institution will reignite a national debate and persuade Australia to back a referendum within a year of the Queen stepping down from the throne. And it's this timing that former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull believes could be enough to see the Republicans victorious. I think, frankly, in Australia, there are more Elizabethans than there are monarchists. And so I think after the end of the Queen's reign, that is the time for us to say, OK, we've passed that watershed. Do we really want to have whoever happens to be the head of state of the, the king or queen of the UK uh, automatically our head of state? We should be so proud of our country and our fellow countrymen and women that we should say only an Australian should be eligible to be our head of state. Well, that's the exact same argument he made 22 years ago. Is there any reason to do it today? Uh, is this the moment where I should out myself for having been the media liaison officer for the Royal Tours eons ago? Who are you? I have issued more dress bulletins <laughs> than you can possibly imagine. Um, yeah, look, uh, honestly, you know, it just feels like distraction therapy, but doesn't it? And I kind of go, oh, God, haven't we got enough to worry about at the moment? Okay. I'm torn between don't we have enough to worry about, do we really need to think about this now, and the fact that I think Malcolm may very well be right that there are more Elizabethans than there are monarchists.
Ah, so we're 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 loyal to Her Majesty the Queen, not to the not to the to nation. the larger institution. Yes. So, I mean, I think he's probably right. It's time to have a bit of a discussion about it. But you know, I think there are so many other things to worry about, at least from my perspective at the moment. It's not going to be top of my priority list. Okay. The question that always comes up, Adrian Piccoli, is can you do this easily? Do you think you can? No. <laughs> I want the Queen is alive, certainly, and um, maybe not even for a while after she's um, she's no longer with us. It's it's, it's what happened um, back whenever it was twenty years ago when the referendum was on. Uh, you know, it's the it's it's not broke, don't fix it thing in most people's minds. Are kind of like kind of like Margie said, like it's not really the most pressing problem we've got. So why are we sort of expending our energy on it? People don't know what are uncertain about what happens if you change to a republic. They know what they get now and they're reasonably happy with that form of government. I mean, I'm an avowed republican. I think the, the royal family is, is a kind of a ridiculous concept that some, some random family, as they say on Monty Python, where somebody in a lake handed somebody a sword and they became the king, um, is hardly the way to form a, government, form a system of government. Um, so it doesn't make sense to me. but. I don't think people in Australia are particularly hungry at this stage to change. And even post the Meghan Markle, Harry interview, I don't think that's going to change that much. Can, can I just say to you, for what it would cost to run a referendum and to do all of the things that they would have to do to legislation to change it, I want that money spent on the tourism industry <laughs> instead and I want it now. <laughs> we, we will come to that. So, Lisa Wadigo, this is interesting. Um, uh, yes. What these folks are saying is, oh, look, there's probably a reason to do it but there's a bit of inertia around it. Do you see yeah. any other obstacles? I saw you rolling your eyes when, <laughs> when Adrian said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So fix you it. take uh. me through what you think are the obstacles to, oh. uh, you know, when you flip the coin over, you don't see Charles or Lilibet anymore. Yeah, there's there's so many layers to this. Uh -huh. I mean, the first thing is, is that, you know, I have, I'm, I'm not particularly, I'm trying to not be, particularly interested in the Harry and Meghan story, right. even though it floods my feeds. Yeah. Um, but, of course, I have no doubt that she's she has experienced absolutely abhorrent racism um, through her, her period of time with the family. The treatment that she's received at the hands of the British media has just been absolutely disgusting. Um, but the monarchy is the foundation or one of the foundations of the colonial system that we have in this country and any opportunity to get rid of it of course is a good thing having said that and i'm going to contradict myself again here probably <laughs> is that yes i'm definitely a republican or an, i'm definitely not a monarchist but do we just simply go well we'll take um the uh -huh. windsors out and we'll transplant it with something else i don't think a simple solution is the solution. Um, we really want to understand, and I think there's an opportunity if we're going to do this and and you know spend all of that money and uh, you know or resources in in actually having this conversation. How do we incorporate in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander? peoples into that process. Mm -hmm. You know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have not ceded sovereignty. So uh -huh. this is fundamentally an issue about sovereignty. Now, I'm not a constitutional lawyer. I'm not a constitutional lawyer. I, you know, um, I'm just a lay person like the majority of people who are watching this program. And, and I think that that's really the issue is like, how do we transform this? And I, I know that, you know, Professor Megan Davis and so many other people have been doing this work around the statement of the heart and there's treaties happening in Victoria. There's pathway to treaty here in um, Queensland as well. And I think that there's a bigger, bigger question mm -hmm. that's going to require all of us as Australians to, you know, e examine ourselves. And, and, you know, it may be a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the way that, you know, which is what Jackie Huggins is 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 adv has advocated for, In and um, yeah, yeah it, it's not just, it's not simple. Let me let me. It let would me be nice if we could just put somebody else on the other side of the coin. <laughs> <laughs> let but me it's see not that I, simple. Let me see if I have you here. That that you, there's no simple A to B. You've got to get A to Z. So is what you're saying is mm. if you say righto, uh, we don't want the. Queen Elizabeth or King Charles to be sovereign, you go, OK, that was easy. Mm -hmm. That's what Adrian said, easy. That's what Malcolm said, good. 
Okay, so who's going to be sovereign? Because Indigenous people never ceded sovereignty. So how do you create a new modern republic if you haven't mm. had a just and proper settlement? And then the next thing you seem to be saying to me is, oh, good. We're all seem to be agreeing. Get rid of the elements of a remnants of a colony. You know, that, that thing in the corner of the flag, right? The Union Jack. Uh, but uh, how are you going to come to terms with the impacts of colonisation to do that? Mm. Dispossession do of we just renovate people? the house or do we knock down and rebuild it? Well, can you just like, renovate the house? I mean, if you say sovereignty and you say colony, yeah. you're, you're going to have to go there, aren't you? Lisa? Yeah. Isn't that I, astounding? I think so. Yeah? Ellen, that... Uh, and you'd remember this referendum. I did. I, I took my uh, daughter, who's now 30 years old, and I gave her the pencil and I got her to put a one in the box. But what, so did, you she... think, what did you think a modern Australian republic in 1999 was? Who what is would... astounding, what is astounding is that at that referendum, there was nothing about their settlement. There was nothing about um, Indigenous Australian sovereignty. That could never happen now. Um, so that's right. So that does make it more complicated. Having said that, we're doing a lot of <laughs> one hand the other. Having said that, um, I think the, the Republic issue is settled. Uh, when the White Australia policy, if you try and look up to see when the White Australia policy ended, it's very difficult because uh, although it was uh, formally ended, as uh, Gough Whitlam formally ended it, it had been in practice, it, it had withered a long time before that. Mm. Uh, it had just been people stopped uh, implementing it, uh, no one took it seriously. This is what has happened, in my view, in uh, you know the, the two decades since the referendum. There's no support for uh, the monarchy. You but, know, no no majority is, support. It's gone. It's but, it's, but it's Lisa, an artifact. Let but, me but put this to Lisa though. It's that, there that, until we that, blow the cards down. Isn't that like saying, "Oh, I want to be a doctor. That's settled," but I haven't done the work. Right? I mean, if you look at the Uluru Statement, we invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future, substantive constitutional change, so this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australian nationhood. I mean, we can't exactly whip past Makarata, can we, coming together after a struggle and a process that you have to go through to get, quote, a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia. I mean, isn't that the work that you'd have to do to get to the other uh side of that? That's the rebuild. That's part of the rebuild. I mean, it's, there's issues around compensations and there's issues around and making sure that individual communities get to tell their stories. Um, it's the way that governments and the state work and engage with Indigenous communities on the ground. I mean, there's just so much work to be done. Um, and I don't... And I... I think it's a rebuild. I think that's what we've got to do. We've got to knock the system down and rebuild it that a so that it actually incorporates Indigenous, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, uh, perspective, sovereignty, whatever that looks like. And I and again, I, I keep saying I'm not a constitutional lawyer, but it's you know it's stuff things that people, ordinary Australians, can actually get behind. Is that not part of the point though that you know to have this Republican debate now mm. would stimulate exactly? that kind of debate, or it should. So, you know, that might be, you know, with me saying, oh, do we really need to worry about being, you know, worrying about the Republican thing at the moment? Well, maybe it is a good thing to talk about and have a conversation about because we have to deal with all of those things and maybe it's a trigger um, to sort of refocus attention on dealing with all of those issues because mm. I quite often feel that we're, we're not quite whole while we don't deal with this issue. Not the and we've been shown one, a way, issue. we've been shown mm. how to do it. The idea of a voice to parliament is, you know, it, it doesn't actually require that much. They've, they've, they've set out steps. It doesn't require this detailed work with every Aboriginal community or, or so mm. on. It's, a, it's something we could do, something I hope this or the next um, Prime Minister does and uh, long live Her Majesty. I hope that she lives long enough mm. so that we can get this sorted in time for the She's Republic 94. referendum. Adrian, I just, just before we move on, your reflections on that. Do you agree that if you open up the idea of sovereignty, you're going to have to have a conversation about Indigenous sovereignty? If you open up the idea of getting rid of the remnants of colony, 
you're going to have to look at the effects. You're going to have to decolonise, look at the effects of colonisation. Today we had heard about the third Aboriginal death in custody this month. I mean, that you, ha that you inevitably open that up. Do you accept that? Well, I, I think that's right, and it's a good thing. It's a good thing for Australia to open that up again because it's not closed. I mean, people may think it's closed, but it's not closed for Aboriginal people. It's very open and very unresolved. There are lots of, you know, long... There are lots of wounds there. I, I remember when Prince Charles came here a few years ago with Camilla. There was an event at Government House there on the on the harbour in Sydney. And I think, and I, I could be wrong here, but was, I think it was Chicka Madden did the Welcome to Country. And then Prince Charles got up and spoke. And I'm looking at him. He's looking out at Sydney Cove where... His relatives' ships arrived, you know, however many years earlier. And I just thought, you know, for an Aboriginal person, this is this has got to... It just does my head in. It does, should, should do everybody's head in. That's why I think, you know, history doesn't just, history doesn't just stop. You, Australia has to keep evolving as a country and recognising the things that we haven't recognised in the past around issues like Aboriginal sovereignty and what role... I mean, the Crown is always going to be part of Australian history. It doesn't matter what happens. But that role mm. can and should change and mm. should reflect what, actu what, what everybody in Australia wants, and particularly Aboriginal um, people who, who are the original inhabitants of this continent. Mm. Mm. Wonderful discussion. You're watching The Drum and with me on the panel, CEO of the Tourism and Transport Forum, Margie Osman, Managing Director at Iscariot Media, Lisa Watigo, Business and Economy Editor at The Conversation, Peter Martin, and Professor of Practice at UNSW School of Education, Adrian Pickley. In just over two weeks, the government's job keeper scheme that's kept millions of Australians in work throughout the pandemic will end. Now, for many, life is back to normal. Businesses are open and jobs are secure. But while our borders remain closed, entire industries are unable to operate. That's why the Prime Minister stood up today brandishing a novelty plane ticket to announce new support measures. As JobKeeper ends at the end of this month, together with the COVID supplement, we go into a new phase where we'll see the economy continue to grow and continue to support jobs all around the country. But in the aviation, in the travel, in the tourism sectors, we know it'll continue to be tough, particularly in, in, in those parts of the country most reliant on international tourism. To keep people in their jobs, We've got to put planes in the air and we've got to put tourists on the ground. The stimulus aims to get more Australians spending on domestic holidays by offering up to half price flights to 13 destinations. The two components that I think makes the big difference to wars, first of all, is the 800,000 discounted tickets. That will stimulate demand. That will get people to go to the 13 destinations, the 13 regions, and it will cover 57 different routes on our network to get people to travel to those destinations at non-peak times. But not everyone is as pleased with the plan as Alan Joyce. Queensland's Treasurer has highlighted that the package is contingent on borders staying open as the discounted flights are only for those travelling interstate. There are some dead set head scratches of this that seem bizarre. Why, why can't mm. Queenslanders uh, be supported to travel to Queensland? Why can't they go to Cairns? We'll act on the health advice. And that's been consistent, the position we've taken all along. And, of course, that was endorsed by the people of Queensland in the election last October. But after a year of disruption, some operators in the affected regions have told us they were expecting more. I think it's fantastic for our region. Uh, it's going to give a massive domestic boost, uh, which is much needed. Usually after Easter, there's a bit of a lull up here um, through the uh, late April and May period. And I think that'll be fantastic for that for that time period to get a big boost. Cairns is a place that relies 100% on aviation. Fantastic news. You know, it gives me confidence to open our business again. Unfortunately, I don't think that they're going to really help us on the ground here in Cairns just because it will take some time for the people to arrive. JobKeeper finishes on the 28th of March. A lot of staff have been asking what happens um, after JobKeeper, so I've just been telling them sort of we'll, we'll have these conversations after the big announcement um, today, and uh, I guess still left with a lot of uncertainty. 
We've actually lost 67% of our workforce in the past 12 months. And when JobKeeper finishes, I expect that we're probably going to lose another 10 to 15%. That's a lot of staff, which are highly skilled staff. Any supports welcomes so the 50% off flights um, will, be, will be great for some businesses in Cairns, but um, at the end of the day, uh, I run international youth hostels. So pre-COVID, 100% um, of our bookings were international. So even if there's a little bit of an uptake in the domestic market, um, it just doesn't replace opening international borders. The loans offered to, to businesses now, I think are, are fantastic. Uh, the loan uh, amounts have increased, which I think is, is very good for, for larger operators. I know a lot of other business owners in Cairns who they've had their loans deferred, their mortgages deferred. They are now facing down the barrel of a tsunami of um, repayments. Who wants to work for the next 10 years for nothing? We would have really liked to have seen some support rolled out in conjunction with this, um, these great flights that the government is doing. I was really hoping for some um, continued wage subsidies or, or grants, but it looks like that hasn't happened today. While I'd love to you know, still uh, have some job keeping for some months ahead, I think it's now time that we stand on our own feet. Yeah, so mixed views there in far north Queensland. Maggie, you've just pointed out that Darwin was added to the list, so there are 14 destinations. Mm. Uh, the PM says it's a ticket to recovery, is it? Well, uh, I think it's a great idea to put some stimulus in place. There's no doubt that traveller confidence has been trashed by the border exercise. And to be perfectly frank, there's a whole lot of premiers who need to wake up to themselves in that space and follow, follow Gladys Berejiklian's example. So... At that level, in terms of stimulating activity, getting Australians feeling more confident about flying again, hopefully putting a bit of pressure on the states to keep those borders reliably open. And the, just, just, just as quickly, the reason that you say that is because this only works for interstate tourism. That's right. So the Queensland Premier shuts the border, the West Australian Premier shuts the border. Doesn't that, happen. The ta so it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, twisting the arm of the Premiers up their backs to say, righto, come on. Absolutely. So right. from a stimulus perspective, bravo, well done. Mm. Very happy to see it. I'm sure there some tweaks to the system but the government has said if you want to add more destinations we're happy to look at it and as we say they've added Darwin this afternoon. I think the big issue is that while they've done a little bit of increased assistance for things like zoos and aquariums which is great you've got to keep those animals and everything else healthy uh, there's a bit of additional assistance for the travel agents for example and there's some sort of infrastructure security support for airports and others. The key part of it that's supposed to assist the wider business community to survive this period, and by that I mean the ones that are really affected uh, and open to the impact of international visitors, is a series of small business loans. Mm -hmm. um, and I know the government's very keen on them and, uh, you know, feel that they're going to make the difference. So, so people who would have been on, on JobKeeper, and when we were in Cairns not long ago, we met a lot of those people who were in that package, they were saying, look, the reality here is 40 to 60% of any business is going to be reliant on international tourism. So great, get some more interstate tourism, but they're hanging on to those workforces through a wage subsidy. Yep. And you're saying the government's saying, OK, well, well we've expanded the small to medium uh, SME loan guarantee scheme for small and medium-sized businesses. What, does that solve the problem? So you go from a wage subsidy paid by the government to your staff, or through you to your staff, to, OK, you borrow the money and see yourself yeah. through. And therein lies the problem. Uh, you know, how long does it take to get the loan from the bank in the first place? If it finishes on the, you know, at the end of March, how long would it take to get the loan? How easy is that going to be? How much more debt can these businesses take on? Mm -hmm. Now, I fully understand that it's not the taxpayer's job to prop up a whole lot of businesses, but essentially in this set of circumstances when we're completely beholden to government and public policy at both state and federal level, yes, I think there is an argument, as the government itself has clearly recognised by putting together a package. We think still that a wage subsidy subsidy was always going to be the best way to go and it's why countries like Singapore have extended theirs for another six months for tourism and aviation. Having said that, we've come a long way in the last six months from a point where nobody was terribly interested in what was happening to tourism to there being a focus. So I have to be grateful to the government that they've done that. Mm. But I'm hoping the door's still open to have a further conversation because I still think we're going to see hundreds of thousands of people unemployed at the end of March. Mm.
Lisa Wadigo, you're out of QUT Business School. That's one of the hats that you wear as well as running your own, um, your own business in Brisbane. What are your thoughts on that loan scheme? So eligible loans, there was $40 billion in the bucket for this mm. scheme, but nobody was taking it up, which probably tells you something. That's $2 to $3 billion only was taken up. So the government says you can get a bigger loan, up to $5 million. Uh, bigger businesses can be involved in the scheme and instead of going 50-50 with the banks, and a lot of people had trouble convincing the banks, even if the Feds were kicking in 50% of the loan money, they're going to have to go 80% mm. federal money and 20% of the banks, presumably, to get more of those loans ticked off by the banks. Does it make sense for particularly the small operators you know to be taking on that sort of debt? I would be really... Yeah, cautious about that. Um, I know uh, a lot of the businesses that we were working with last year at the start of COVID, um, Indigenous businesses across Queensland, the financial part, like a lot of the financial packages that were coming, that were being made available, just weren't available. To, Indigenous businesses quite often will just fall through the cracks. You know, you may not have the capital um, to service such a loan. You may have a, you know, your books might not be perfect because you're simply so busy in your business that you're... And all the accountants, I think, across Australia were trying to understand what job keeper and job seeker yeah, and all yeah. of these new things meant. Those poor guys were absolutely smashed with work um, and often it was unpaid advice. But, yeah, I would be really hesitant as a small business owner to be taking out a loan um, that you don't know that you can service. If we don't get international... If your assumption is, is that we're going to have international visitors, then I think you're... Then I would be really, really concerned about that. I'm lucky I'm not in the tourism sector. I do work with a lot of tourism businesses. I mean, one of the other things is if you've got an ATO debt, you may not actually qualify for a loan. Right. So I'm not 100% sure that it's going to be as um, taken up as people would hope, the government would hope that it would be. Um, yeah. And I think that, yeah. One of the things that we do know with Indigenous experiences, Indigenous tourism experiences, is once a domestic... Because they're quite heavily reliant on international visitors. But if we, um, if we can only focus on domestic visitors, we know from research that if, you, uh, uh, if an, a domestic visitor experiences one Indigenous experience, then they're more likely to... Um, go and pay for and, 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 and seek out other Indigenous mm. experiences. So I think that there's a lot of education that we need to do with our domestic market um, to, to really get them interested in going to a, um, Indigenous experiences in particular. Mm. Um, I think that there's just a lot of communication work that we need to do. Mm -hmm. And I know that you were saying to our producer Dale earlier that um, there's a lot of those sorts of experiences and businesses around central Queensland and the Longreach area that aren't getting tourists. So just a shout out to them. Yeah. Longreach in winter, wonderful. Pack your woolies. Yep. Terrific part of the world. Um, and, an ama and some amazing Indigenous experiences yep. out there. So if you get to go to Long Longreach and Barky head out and see the Thompson sisters. And, and, right <laughs> and legitimately too, out of this whole horrible situation with COVID and the impact that it's had on the industry, I'm hopeful that what we're going to see is a renaissance, if that's an okay word to use in the context, of Indigenous tourism. Because most people go overseas to have a unique experience of mm. some kind. Mm. We have so many of that, so many of those on offer here in Australia and absolutely to Lisa's point it's all about the education to understand mm. what's out there and what you can do and what you can see. Mm. Well I'm just actually trying to get the program to go to Long Reach, so that's actually why I Excellent. said that. Excellent. <laughs> I'll I didn't... go. <laughs> Um, Adrian Piccoli, you're, I'll, I'll come to Peter Martin in a moment, but Adrian Piccoli, you're more optimistic about this scheme, aren't you? I think about it from the perspective of when you're, when you're a government and you've got a billion dollars and you've got to think, OK, what am I going to do with that? We know it's not enough, mm -hmm. but how do we get the most bang for our buck? So I think what the government's doing here is they're hoping they can turn a billion dollars of government spending into 10 $10 billion of private spending. And they're trying to unlock consumer or, or private spending to stimulate the tourism market. So you could spend a, a billion dollars um, continuing some of these wage subsidies, and what you're and which is which is an option. But what you're doing is you're keeping people home. Uh, what they're trying to do is get people travelling to spend their own money. So if you if you subsidise me a few hundred dollars to fly to Cairns, uh, yes, a few hundred dollars. But then I'm going to spend another couple of thousand dollars, three thousand dollars on accommodation and tours and restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the real, that's the real stimulus. It's, it's the 300 helps, mm. but it's
but it's actually the few thousand dollars but, but the only uh, thing that, is that private spending there's still a lot not understood about this scheme the fact that that Darwin was tacked on um, you know it's it's a work in progress obviously but Adrian the former chief economist of Qantas and they have a chief economist at Qantas Tony Weber he crunched the numbers right and he figures that only 72 million of the 1.2 billion dollar package will fund ticket price discounts. So he's looked at the numbers of tickets between April and July, he's crunched the numbers and he's saying, look, I don't think that'll encourage much travel and Flight Centre's Graham Turner is saying, um, slightly diplomatically, fairly small positive impact on tourism. So, I mean, pending the details, looks like an aviation package. <laughs> Well, well, I presume you still need, you know, Qantas and, and Jetstar, uh, sorry, Virgin, still need people to actually book those flights and pay half the, half the fare. So it's only a package for the aviation industry if people actually fly, would be my understanding. I don't know all of that technical detail. But I'm just trying to think how, how, how do governments think about this uh, and how do treasuries think about this. And they're trying to unlock private spending. Now, there is pent-up demand for tourism. People are reluctant to travel because, as Margie said about the border, you don't want to be in Cairns and suddenly you can't get back to Melbourne or Sydney. But they're trying to unlock consumer spending. You could spend it and subsidise wages and keep people who work in businesses home and keep people who travel at home. But that's not how you restart the industry. Mm. Can I just say, though, too, in the subject of this is an aviation package, it's really important to understand that we don't have a tourism industry without aviation. We're a long-haul destination and everything in Australia is long-haul virtually if you're going to go anywhere interstate. So it's natural that there should be some sort of aviation support and something significant. And but I you've agree. got to have something to come see. That's the other part of the puzzle. That's yeah. the other part of the puzzle. Yeah. And can I, can I just say that um, I think one of the things that would actually help the aviation industry, and this is from a, a layperson's perspective again, um, make booking and cancelling tickets and rebooking tickets much easier. I mean, I think part of the a consumer, as a consumer, I'm not going to necessarily book a ticket to Sydney in for three months' time if there is a border closure, which as a Queenslander I don't hate, um, mm. I, I don't want to have to spend $80 on a $60 ticket to change the ticket. I don't understand, and there's probably aviation experts out there can, who can tell us why it is so expensive to simply change, you know, give a ticket to someone else or You know, we can answer that question bookings. right now. Go on, Muggy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so think, frustrating. Yeah, look, I think there's been an awful lot of fluctuations in what happens with the tickets. All the airlines have been trying to do the right thing and I know people out there will be saying... But they are, because what they really want to do is get people back in the air. But the bottom mm. line is that none of them have had any revenue for a very long time. And there's massive uh, and, costs associated with And there's with massive all the, costs. And yeah, part of the, the issue changing. with the, the border issue is, for some reason I don't understand, premiers seem to think that when you close or open the border, it's kind of like you just flick the switch and the planes get back up in the air. There's a really significant um, build-up mm. that has to happen to make it possible to get back up in the air and then turn it off again or put extra staff on. So there's been massive massive expenses for the industry, but they're all dead keen to get you back in the air. If they could make it easier, they would be. Well, I want to come to Peter Martin. It's interesting that journalists immediately need to check these days, Pete, whether or not there's any pork barrelling with programs like this or bushfire support or anything else. Um, it seems that many of the um, initial destinations are marginal or winnable uh, electorates for the government, certainly not all. Questions were asked by Labor about why northern Tasmania with its marginal seats and not southern Tasmania. Um, there was a question asked about why Central Australia and not Darwin. That's been changed this afternoon. Um, what are your thoughts about the winners they've picked? Well, I'm actually worried about the sector they've picked. Sorry, Margie. So you should uh, be, Peter. The, 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 <laughs> there are businesses, there are, in fact, businesses that employ one million Australians, the, the latest We used uh, to figures. employ one million Australians. Yes. <laughs> well, there are businesses who employ one million Australians, down from three, who are still on JobKeeper, which uh, ends on the, uh, on the 28th. Now, a lot of them are not in that sector. The Prime Minister talked about aviation and tourism being affected by international border closures. What about universities? What about firms that provide services to universities? The government has it's gone beyond calling it a blind spot. The government has willfully done everything it can not to support uh, this large sector and all of the associated businesses, 
and many, many others. We, we are now facing, with those million Australians who've been basically having their salaries paid, we are now facing one of, there was another uh, sort of uh, cliff around September uh, when they were going to end JobKeeper but fortunately decided to continue it at a lower rate. We are now facing uh, one of, of, of the biggest, if you like, testing points, crises in the you know, entire job seeker, entire support experience. Unemployment at the moment is around 800 measured unemployment, uh, around uh, 800,000 Australians. You add a million to that and you do a lot to it, right? Yeah. Now, one estimate, a reasonable estimate from Jeff Borland at uh, Melbourne University is uh, a quarter of a million Australians. Uh, and so, we'll, so is, is, we'll, is, we'll lose their jobs, right? And we'll is lose this, their is jobs. This on March 28th. So basically, your, yeah. your maths is you've got to give a fortnight's notice to people. So in the next three days, if today's the 11th, which it is, in the next three days, people are going to have to give yeah. uh, their employees notice. And, and then in three days, notice. and in three days, by the way, they have to deal with the situation of unless they're maybe hoping this Qantas thing, this airline thing, which isn't worth that much money anyway, maybe hoping that money multiplies, maybe hoping it works, or very likely they're not in that industry at all. That won't help them. Mm. They have to face the situation of, I've had no work, but I've been able, you know, not much business coming in, but I've been able to uh, continue to pay my people. Do I take out a loan hoping that situations, borders uh, open and so on, hoping that situations improve for the next five years, or do I wind my business up? This is certainly the second most critical point in the whole thing. Now, if the government pulls this off, well, all, uh, you know, they'll probably say they, they, they were confident all along. Um, if they don't, I think the good thing is that, uh, I wrote about this in the conversation this week, uh, we're getting very, very good stats coming in now, better than ever before. 10 million uh, payroll, uh, t you know, 10 mm. data on 10 million Australians is collected and published each week now. We used to have to wait weeks for the monthly unemployment figures that uh, weren't nearly as comprehensive. The government will be able to see in real time, uh, as you're suggesting, Ellen, you know, beginning next week, yeah they'll be able to see in real time what's happening and uh, make adjustments. But this is a really critical time. Yeah. This, this is, this is uh, you know, as I said, the, the second worst All in right. the whole crisis. I just want to make one final point. We've got some lovely pictures to show, Margie. You and I were talking earlier, um, courtesy of Foreign Correspondent. And it's, it, it's the, the world is changing. It's a look at Bali and, and there's people here that you're seeing mm. Uh, traditionally involved in the in the tourism industry, have been for decades, such a massive part of Bali's economy. And here they are returning to traditional but subsistence level seaweed farming. Uh, so they might have been fast boat operators, tourism op operators. One of the men we're seeing, Wayan, was earning 800 a month in tourism, just bought that extra property to rent out and there comes COVID and he's down to $200. Uh, a month. No support there, obviously. But is that the sort of adjustment you think we're going to see in tourism in different ways, right, across the world? Oh, I don't think there's any doubt about it. And the United Nations World Tourism Organisation is quite concerned about it at the moment and what the implications are. Um, I think the other part of this puzzle that's going to be very big is going to be sustainability and the tourism industry mm -hmm. in future. And we really need to look at ourselves in that space. Um, for example, my organisation is doing a huge amount of work now on aviation biofuels because we know when the international market comes back on, the people coming to us ultimately from Northern Europe and the US and whatever else are going to be asking the question about the carbon offsets and what sort of fuel we're using. So yes, it's going to change a whole lot of tourism structures. In some places maybe it should and in more developed countries I think it's going to make us focus on some of these things like sustainability that are just going to be pivotal to the future. Yeah. Well, remember, it's not just tourism and aviation experiencing a long hangover from 2020. It's been four months since China implemented hefty tariffs on Australian wine, effectively banning much of the product from the country. Before the tariffs came in, China alone accounted for 40% of all wine exports. And as the drums, Stephanie Bolchi found out, South Australia's Barossa Valley has felt the hit more than most. <laughs> 
South Australia's Barossa Valley is billed as Australia's most famous wine region. And a lot of wine that was being, being sent to China was on the back of Barossa Valley Shiraz. And Yulumba has been making it here for more than 170 years. But when China imposed a 218% tariff on Australian wine, within months exports practically ceased. Yulumba was initially one of those few wineries questioned by China over accusations Australia was dumping its wine there. We didn't quite know why, but then again, there were three companies on that list of 10 who didn't export to China at all. While China continues its investigations, it's unclear if temporary tariffs will become permanent. Either way, the South Australian Wine Industry Association president says it'll be up to five years of hurt. Whether or not the industry will be game enough to go back into bed with the Chinese when they you know, relax the tariff regime is a question I think they need to ask themselves. While the private-owned winery was a smaller player in the China market, with 8% exported there and accounting for 5% of their business, they had grander plans. We would have seen that becoming probably the second most important market to us in the, in the medium term. Like others, they are looking at growing in markets such as the UK and the US and potentially other parts of Asia. The Randall Wine Group, which owns Seppertsfield, is a major player in premium bulk wine. They send wine in 24,000 litre bladders, but that stopped last year. Even though there's no um, uh, tariff directly been placed upon bulk product, the central government there has instructed all of its importers, its producers, to stop taking uh, Australian wine. The managing director says that's about 15% of their revenue. So it's a big hit. Um, I think you'd broadly describe it as a black eye, maybe a blood nose as well. Um, you know, not terminal, we've got options, but it's, it's, it's a fair hit. And while they're looking elsewhere, they're planning on storing wine too. Sepult's Field's in it for the long game. We've invested so much time and effort and we believe that, uh, you know, it's worth uh, the long play. Adrian Piccoli, you're in Griffith tonight. That's a wine-growing region. What are your thoughts uh, on that? Always when I see these trade, uh, trade kind of wars, it's always agriculture. Why always agriculture? You know, <laughs> why not financial services or <laughs> mining or something like that? It's always barley or wheat or land. <laughs> You want to come, come to the city and, and, and get a, bu a bucket of black paint and paint uh, <laughs> paint uh, well, target, look, targets you know, on, uh, on big, big bank buildings. Is that your idea? <laughs> they, you know, they're, soft, they're seen as soft targets or I, I don't know. Anyway, uh, it's, it's really unfortunate for the wine industry, big, big wine industry here in the Riverina and very successful. Uh, you know, a number of the wineries that I've spoken to over the last couple of years said they've they're very cautious about, um, have always been very cautious about China for this very reason, they're unpredictable. I mean, it's a communist country that is politically unpredictable. And look, they are responding to some of the things that Australia, the Australian government has said and done, which I agree with what they've said and done. There's been criticism of governments over the last couple of decades, oh, longer, over decades, that we've let China off the hook for a lot of things because of the economic ties. Uh, not so much in the last few years, and then this is the this is the consequence. But I've got to say, in terms of the values that we espouse as Australians, I think the things that have been said and done by the Australian government uh, have been good. Have been good about whether it's COVID or human rights or whatever else it might be. Um, you know, it, it's unfortunate these are the consequences. Mm. Um, but but I think you know we're actually standing up for the values that Australians believe in. Nearly out of time, Peter Martin. I suspect you're going to uh, take Adrian Piccoli's blood pressure through the roof. What do you think? I agree with Adrian Piccoli. Oh, good. Oh. Um, but I, I would add, I mean, I completely agree yeah. on China. Yeah. I completely agree. Uh, Australia's uh, values, approach, particularly to the things, uh, the, the changes in China, are not for sale. Um, having said that, um, the, the, uh, the, the, we have far more uh, anti-dumping actions against uh, China than any other country. Wind towers, photocopy paper, aluminium, herbicides, we impose heavy duties on them. Now, uh, obviously, they're, 
They've got other beefs with Australia, but uh, our hands aren't clean there. All right. And, Margie, just a last question on the tourism thing. Do you think any of this will affect when the borders finally open? It'd be great to have you to have a debate back about when we're going to open those borders, mm. how many of us need to be vaccinated, what risks we're prepared to take. Chinese tourists come back from mainland China? Oh, gosh, I hope so. I really hope so. It's one of the big dangers of the current situation because China was our number one market. And, you know, Chinese people spend on average eight and a half, nine thousand dollars $9,000 while they're here compared to an Australian Aussie tourist who probably spends, ooh, about $1,500, $2,000 if you're really lucky. Mm. So critical return. And apart from that, we've been joined from a tourism point of view for so very long. There's a long history there. I'd hate to see that trashed. Mm. We're out of time. That's all we have time for. Thanks to our panel, to Margie Osmond. Cheers, lovely to see you, Lisa Watergo. Uh, Peter Martin was in tonight as well and Adrian Piccoli. Have a great evening and Jules is back, uh, recovered from her cold tomorrow night. So good night. Okay. She had the flu, I think, almost. Poor girl. Yeah, yeah. Tonight on ABC TV and iView, join guest presenter Paul West on all new Backroads, then Q&A, later Kurt Fernley's OnePlus One.